Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hojuana and today we are following up on the promised look at fusion engines. They pop up all over the place in sci-fi that wants to give an air of believability to a setting, even if the way they are used isn't genuine and they're just fancy names for magic engines. But first, what even is fusion? Simply put, nuclear fusion is the act of taking multiple atoms and combining them together to make larger ones. However, the mass of the single created atom is less than that of the two that were fused into it, with the leftover mass being transformed into kinetic energy and photons. So while it takes the tremendous amount of heat and pressure found inside stars and supernovas to happen, it can end up creating more energy than was put into it. That excess powers stars and makes them shine, and it's what we want to harness down here on Earth for power production and up in space for engines. That is of course a gross simplification of a highly complex and extremely challenging field of physics, as there's many different fusion fuels and products for both natural and artificial fusion. For the latter, there's a number of different approaches and methods to get atoms to fuse, and adding on the need to generate thrust out of that makes things even more complex and interesting. So let's run down some of those methods to create the extreme conditions inside the core of a star, but without actually carting around an entire sun in the engineering section of your spacecraft. The first of these, magnetic confinement, is the classic approach to artificial fusion and involves containing and squeezing the fusion fuels within extremely powerful magnetic fields. This is most commonly done within tokamaks, donut shaped machines that just look incredibly cool from the inside. There's some variations and different configurations of the standard donut, including the bizarre looking but awesomely named Stellarator. The second major family is inertial confinement, which involves hitting fusion fuel capsules with sudden blasts of energy on every side, causing it to collapse inward to fuse the fuel within, which can be done with lasers or sometimes ions or even x-rays. Sometimes there's even multiple stages of this, with one type of squashing beam driving another. This is the method that got a lot of attention in December last year thanks to the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. They announced, for the first time, getting more energy out of a fusion reaction than they put in using lasers that shot a special container that then made x-rays that hit the fusion fuel. Interestingly, this machine was the Enterprise's warp core in Into Darkness, and for another sci-fi connection, laser confinement is also the method of fusion the Rosinante uses. Next up is pinches, where you squeeze an electrically conductive plasma with magnetic or electric fields within it, and you already know all about if you watched the plasma weapons video. These designs actually predate the more well-known tokamaks and such, but Z pinches and theta pinches just had too many issues to be viable. There's some other types, but this is meant to be a video about engines, not fusion. So why and how? Well, for starters, the obvious thing is that fusion can make an awful lot of energy for a very low mass of fuel, which is an obviously attractive thing for spacecraft where every gram counts. It also creates so much energy that any engine that harnesses it will end up having a very high exhaust velocity, and if you remember from the previous video, that means it's more efficient. The downsides are that the thrust ends up being pretty low in most cases, at least without severely degrading the efficiency of the thing. There's also so much energy released that the exhaust plume cannot be contained within a physical nozzle, as that would just be obliterated instantly. Instead, magnetic nozzles need to be used, which have their own complications like needing power to run, but you can at least harvest that from the fusion. There's also the slightly nasty matter of a lot of dangerous radiation going on, so special considerations need to be taken there in regards regards to crew safety and so on, keep those engines away from people. But depending on the fusion fuels used, there can be so much radiation, so many neutrons and x-rays and gamma rays created, which all cannot be redirected with a magnetic field, that the superconductive elements of a mag nozzle still get vaporised. Remember, these things use the power of stars. This is where blade shields come in, which are sort of like angled armour but for the technical parts of the engine. These highly angled shields mean that those harmful high energy things either ricochet away or have their energy spread over such a large surface area they can't heat the blades up enough to vaporise them. In terms of getting actual thrust out of a fusion engine, you need some form of reaction mass, the stuff that gets fired out one way to make your craft go the other. For fusion engines, there are a few sources of remass, the first being just the products of the fusion itself. 
All those new atoms that get created by squashing smaller ones together have a lot of extra speed and go pinging off into space, directed somewhat by the engine's magnetic nozzle. This has extremely high efficiency but very low thrust, so spacecraft using this sort of drive get pushed along by the force of a barely noticeable breeze, but can do engine burns that last months or even years. If you want to get more thrust out, you can use what is essentially an afterburner, which takes the heat in the fusion products to accelerate regular propellant. Naturally, this also reduces the efficiency of the engine, and you need to bring along the extra reaction mass to be heated up, but you can end up with thrust greater than a hummingbird's fart. This is important if you want to limit travel time for crew and passengers, reducing how long they are exposed to all the cosmic rays flying about, and lowering the amount of supplies they need to bring. There's another similar kind of afterburner that instead captures energy from all the neutrons and x-rays and such given off, which are otherwise just a dangerous, useless bio product and uses it to heat up propellant for extra thrust, or maybe to run a power generation system. You can also just have a fusion generator running electrical engines of some sort, but that's not as exciting as a fusion engine, is it? Now, let's get into some examples of real-world spacecraft concepts with these drives, starting with the Discovery 2, a reimagining of the craft from 2001 A Space Odyssey. The standout feature of this craft, besides the enormous radiators, is the huge 24 meter long spherical Taurus fusion engine. This is a donut-style magnetically confined fusion reactor with a slush hydrogen afterburner that runs down the center of it. The hydrogen gets mixed with a tiny amount of diverted plasma from the reactor to heat it up, and it all gets directed by the big magnetic nozzle on the end there. The exhaust of this thing fires out at 347,000 meters per second, which is pretty high. As a point of comparison, the Raptors on SpaceX's Starship have an exhaust velocity of around 3,500 meters per second, but the Raptors have a bit more thrust at 1.8 million newtons each, while the Discovery 2 only clocks in at 18,000, but it can run continuously for over 200 days all the way out to Saturn, which is where the book placed the giant monolith. It's also possible to magnetically confine fusion plasma in a big long tube rather than by cycling it through a torus. At either end of this tube are extra powerful mirror magnets, which keep the plasma from breaking at the ends. But if you simply make one of these ends a bit leaky, then you've made an engine. This is known as open field magnetic confinement, or the much cooler gas dynamic mirror. One example of this type of engine built around a crewed Mars mission had an exhaust velocity of nearly 1.4 million meters per second, but again again had very low thrust at only 22,000 newtons. The next few examples all make use of non-continuous methods of fusion, so they end up creating pulsed thrust. Now there is a more well-known kind of pulsed thrust using nuclear bombs, but that is a topic all to itself for another time, so subscribe now for that. The first pulsed drive example is the magneto-inertial fusion engine, which, as the name suggests, mixes together magnetic and inertial confinement in two stages. The fusion fuel is fired out in the form of a plasmoid, which then gets surrounded by a series of lithium foil liners, which are then magnetically crushed around the fuel. The liner itself is what compacts the fusion fuel enough to trigger, and then also becomes propellant as it gets flung off by the explosion inside it, directed by the mag nozzle. This has a lot of benefits, such as not needing gigantic radiators, and storing it is very easy compared to cryogenic propellants like hydrogen. Another downside is the lower velocity compared to other types of fusion drive, clocking in at only 49,000 meters per second and 1,470 newtons of thrust. The last and probably more famous fusion drive concept is the gigantic hemispherical inertial confinement drive on Project Daedalus, an interstellar concept designed to send a probe to do a flyby of Barnard's star within 50 years. This enormous engine functions by blasting pellets of deuterium and helium-3 with electron beams, with the fusion products directed by a vast magnetic nozzle, which also acted as a communications dish. This design is truly mind-boggling, not only for how big it is, but also the numbers. The first stage, because yes, this is a two-stage rocket, has an exhaust velocity of over 10 million meters per second, and kicks out 7.5 million newtons of thrust. It's a bit of a step up from the other designs, but this is intended for interstellar flight. 
There's many, many other examples of cool fusion-driven spacecraft, and the drives themselves are often used in sci-fi because of the sheer potential of the technology. It does have its downsides though, such as the hideous amount of radiation they can throw off, and their low thrust, both of which are often hand-waved away for convenience's sake. So if you're going to use fusion for your own creations, maybe consider including those things, as well as some of the awesome sounding terms from real fusion physics. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.